Would you help me give a good T and E welcome to Mr. Pastor Bishop Chris Estrada? I'm telling you. Wow. Oh my gosh. Man, no pressure whatsoever. What's going on, CF and I? How you doing? It's so good to be back. I uh, had a great uh, morning with our first and second year uh, students. It was incredible to be in this space, and uh, I'm just so honored. In fact, thrilled. I was telling Miss Jamie, I said, I could not sleep. I was that excited. Erica and I, my wife Erica and I were so excited that we would have the opportunity to come back. This place means so much to me. Um, this was the place that changed me, formed me, a lot of who I am, the marriage I have, the father that I am, even the minister that I am was literally chiseled in the seats that you're sitting in. So there's, this is a deep well of anointing. This is a transformation location. This ain't a playground. In some cases, it's a battleground because you're contending for so much. Anybody know what I'm talking about, how God can come and absolutely transform? And so I, I just think this place would not exist had it not been in the heart of an incredible family, the Lindsay family. And I just think it would be awesome if we could honor Dr. Lindsay and Miss Ginger. Come on, can you show them how much you love them? Can you honor Golan, who's here, Missy, Hani, Gordon, and Frida Lindsay, just incredible pioneers. I have a tremendous respect. You know, we just... I texted uh, Golan, I think it was maybe the, a few days after we had just done what I was sharing this morning in Los Angeles. I said, man, had it not been for CFNI, I would not have been readied and trained and available like I am. This place taught me so much. It prepared me for what we're walking in right now, and I'm just incredibly indebted to your family, and, and I mean that with deep sincerity. Thank you for your sacrifice and your yes. And then, of course, I, I said it this morning, I really believe, if you don't like Pastor Adam or Pastor Jamie, you're not going to heaven. That's the way it is. Do you love Pastor Adam, Pastor Jamie, and their daughter, Addie McCain, is here? Come on, can you show some love to an incredible leader? Leaders. Listen, fam, if I could just tell you how many times we've called them in emergency situations, how many times we, every time I'm in town, we try to schedule lunch, to schedule dinner, and just drink from the wisdom. There's such a gift of wisdom that's on his life, and Pastor Jamie can talk to any, I've never seen one wall that you could not break down, which is why she's got such a great call in politics, and ministry, and you know, business owner. You guys are phenomenal. You have no idea, and I mean this, very few have understood what it's like to be a spiritual son of theirs, like like Eric and I, uh, and I just appreciate all that you guys have done for us, getting us to where we're at, would not be here without you. One more time, come on, can you give it up for these incredible people? I, um, I, 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 I'm curious, how many of you, this is, my, this is our first time meeting, I know that you're sitting down and I'm on the stage, but raise your hand, this is your first time meeting, how many of you, this is your, you're not from CFNI, you're new, and this is your first night, okay, all Two, three of you, four of you, this is great, wonderful. Well, we've got a lot of, a lot of people. Um, I'm going to share my story just because I know some of you heard this morning, but let me share my story for those uh, in the room. I grew up uh, in a border city where you didn't go there to vacation. In fact, the only reason you went there most of the time was to do something illegal. And I'll never forget, by the age of 12, I found myself with a drug addiction, a lust problem, and an anger issue, but I love to play basketball. Come on, anybody love to hoop in here? Anybody. And so I'd go to this church that had a gym. They would open it before their youth service, and then I, they would try to get everybody from the gym into the service. Well, I would never stay. I would dip and leave and find somewhere else to play. But the youth pastor got involved in my life, and one day he came to me, and he said, hey, you want to go to church camp? And I said, I said, there are going to be hot girls at this camp. I ain't going to waste my time. I use my time wisely. And I'm like, is there fine women at this camp? He said, well, we're going to go for Jesus. I said, you can go for Jesus. I'm going to get some phone numbers. And I'm telling you, on the first night of that camp, which is right here, Youth for the Nations, I got saved, I got filled with the Holy Spirit, and I got called into ministry all in one night. Have not been the same since. Absolutely transformed. And I, I can tell you uh, that... 
the journey that God has had us on has been very unique. We went into business. We went into missions. We were youth pastors. We came on staff here. And to be able to lead what we're leading right now at Missions Me by uniting the global church for the salvation and transformation of nations, there's no way I could do that alone. I, God gave me the perfect person to do this life with, my wife Erica. And we have four beautiful kids. We have four, we call them chickies, four chickies. She, uh, we have four kids. She wants more. I don't. Pray for her, not me. She has a devil. I don't. So I, I, I'm Mexican, and we, I've already done my, I mean, we, we if you know anything, uh, come on, where the, where the caramel people at? Where the brown people at? Where the caramel, uh-huh. And yes, we got some chocolate in here. Where you at, chocolate? Make some noise, chocolate. Yeah, and we got a lot of whipped cream up in this room. Where you at, whipped cream? But I, I, if you know anything about Mexicans, we just multiply like rabbits. So I did my job. I did my job. But I, um, I, I just am so grateful uh, for all the journey that God's had me on. But the truth is, I can't think of a better place to be than right here at TNE tonight. Anybody hyped about being in the first one of the semester? Now, this is, this, this, I'm going to put it out there. Come on, you guys should know how I roll by now. I don't do no quiet church. I, I don't do that. I'm telling you, because I believe a quiet church is a dead church. And I believe the Word of God deserves a response. I believe that the Word of God should have home field advantage. Are you with me? And if I could get the media team, can you turn up my monitors or I'll blow up my voice. I know me. I'm too much of a preacher. Thank you, God. Oh, I can hear it. Thank you. I, I believe the Word of God deserves a response, and I believe the Word of God should have home field advantage. You want to know why? Because I, when I played on my home court, it meant I had the most crowd support. Well, I believe the Word should have the most crowd support in church, the most backup, and have home field advantage. Are you with me? So I need you to respond back to the Word. Can you do that? Somebody say yes. yes. Say, come on, somebody. Come on. Say, walk the dog, Bishop. No lie, I was preaching at a church here locally, and a lady, you know, a, 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 a mama in the church screamed that at me while I was preaching. And, and she just said, you better walk the dog, Bishop. I, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do. I was scared for my life. Um, but I, I'm, I need some hunger. Are you with me? You know, here, here's what's interesting. I'm not talking about hype or passion. You can go get that on YouTube. I'm talking about hunger. Because the truth is, in my Bible, it says God fed the Israelites according to their hunger. Are you following me? So if you get nothing out of night, that wasn't my fault. If you get nothing out of CFNI, that wasn't anyone else's responsibility but yourself. You need to worry about yourself. And if you don't meet God in a place of hunger, you'll miss many times your visitation. It is not the dean's job, your RA's job, your professor's job to make sure you're hungry. You ought to bring an appetite right on with you into these classes, into these courses, into this moment. And if you don't have one, I promise you, if you've never had a spiritual appetite, you're going to get one tonight. I promise you that. So I need to know, is anyone hungry for the Word of God in the building? To there we are. Keep that same energy. Keep that same energy. All right. You know, I was praying into tonight, and um, one, of the, one of the greatest things about being someone that travels is that you have these life messages. It's these things that God marks your life with that from time to time, He'll have you release what would be a familiar message to me, possibly an unfamiliar message to you. And I'm not one to go and do uh, remixes or replays. I like a fresh word. Come on, anybody like fresh bread? Come on, there ain't nothing like a buttery, fresh croissant coming out of Panera Bread. You know what I'm saying? Anyways, um, when, if, back when I ate carbs, Eric's in here, so I don't want to look too fat. Um, Eric, if you don't know, is the gym manager. He's single. Eric, why don't you stand up? It, Eric, go ahead and stand up. Come on, Eric. He's sing This is super single, Eric. He got a job. He got all his teeth. I'm telling you, he good looking too. He from New York, New York in the house, from New York. So, but I, I, um, I, I just really sense that tonight God wants to release something that perhaps, perhaps was birthed for such a time like right now. I, I, this message has carried so much weight around the globe, but I want to preach a familiar message to me tonight. I'm just doing it under obedience. This is, I, I think a lot of times, uh, people just, can I just say this? Sometimes you got to go with the sharpest tool in the shed. And many times what you'll end up doing is try to go and 
build a tool instead of using the sharpest tool in the shed and you'll actually dull yourself and burn yourself out when God already gave, gave you a weapon to familiarize yourself with. And this message is just burning, rumbling, stirring on the inside of me. So I want to go there. Are you going to meet me there? You going to meet me there with some hunger? Anybody hungry tonight? Come on, where the hungry ones at? All right, all right. Hey, um, go to Acts chapter 3. Turn on your Bible. Turn it on and go to Acts, the third chapter. While you're turning there, let me give you some background because we're going to parachute in the middle of a situation right here in Acts chapter 3. I felt like my assignment tonight was to provoke you. I, I, I can make you laugh all night, but if all I did was entertain you and not enlist you, then I missed the assignment for tonight. And I, if this is your first time ever stepping into a church setting, I feel like you need to re realize that God does have a purpose and he does have an assignment for your life. I don't care what your mommy and your daddy said to you. What I care is you coming into promises fulfilled and dreams awakened tonight. And I just really sense my, my job for all the room and my assignment, if I could just be obedient. I've been talking to God about you, about staying in a place of being provoked of staying in a place where you're constantly taking risks. And so I want to look at Acts chapter 3. This is one of Peter's defining moments. You know, all of us have had defining moments. Some of us good. Some of them not so good. Some of you are like, no, I'm way too positive. I have, a, I have my blessed life now. I'm so good. Really? Let's talk about your ex-boyfriend or girlfriend. Let's talk about some defining moments. Some Delilahs. Some Delilos. Some Jezebels. Them old lust bucket. Anyways, all right. You know, Peter has just walked through three intense years of discipleship with Jesus. This is God in the flesh. And he is at a place where he has seen it all. Uh, he has literally watched what no one thought could be possible. He's, he, he has found himself as a fisherman, uh, or he's found as a fisherman, becomes a disciple, released to be an apostle. And here we find him in Acts chapter 3 after the Holy Spirit is poured out, operating in the supernatural. And what we're about to read is the first recorded healing miracle in the New Testament. And uh, I, I just love this passage. This is, a, again, a life passage for me. Look at Acts chapter 3. Let's begin. Let's start eating in verse 1. It says, Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom the people would lay daily at the gate. Come on, someone say Daily. Come on, if you're watching online, just type in daily, daily, daily. Everybody say daily. daily. Who the people lay daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms from those who enter the temple, who seen Peter and John about to go into the temple, started begging, asking for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to receive something. Now let me, let me stop right here before I read verse six, I got a confession to make. First off, I love verse six. I know before we read it, I gotta tell you, I love verse six. I love verse six, because verse six forces you into a choice. There are only two options here. Either you trust God or you don't. You're gonna stand in faith or you're not. You're gonna move forward or you're gonna become stuck. I love, verse, I love verse six for a lot of reasons. Verse six has some power to it. Verse six has some anointing to it. I love verse six because the devil hates verse six. Hello. I, I love verse six for a lot of reasons. He says, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to receive something. And it says, he, Peter said, silver and gold I do not have. But what I do have, I give you. Rise and walk in the name of Jesus. Come on, anybody else hyped about verse 6? Man, I'm telling you. It says, and Peter took him by the right hand, he lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So this man leaped up, stood, walked, and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew it was he who sat begging for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. My goodness, there's a lot to unpack here. Before we do that, I think the key to unlocking something is prayer. Let's pray for a moment. Holy Spirit, I ask for the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. I thank you for every man and every woman 
in this place. In fact, I speak to this atmosphere right now, and I say that you are full of faith, you are full of hope, you are full of peace, and you are full of joy, and I come against every limit, every restriction, every barrier, every lie, every demonic harassment is broken right now in Jesus' name. And I call every man and every woman into their season. I call them into their rhythm. I call them into life. I call them into healing. I call them into breakthrough. I call them into maturity. I call them into growth that we sabotage the plans of the enemy where we're saying it is not okay in my day to not have a historic outpouring. I don't want fake fire. I don't want synthetic fire. I don't want replicated fire. I want a historic outpouring of holy fire coming on my nation, on my cities, and on my family. God, that you would touch my campus, that you would touch those who need a fresh touch of love, a fresh touch of hope, a fresh touch of peace. And Lord, we sabotage and we cancel the assignment of the enemy, all the resistance, all the opposition, we stop it now. I arrest every thought that's not from heaven. I silence every voice that's not from heaven. I come against every generational curse, every destructive pattern, every lie, every deceptive lifestyle. I break it right now in Jesus' name. And I call every man and woman into the front lines of the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. 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 I feel like praying tonight. If you're taking notes, I surely hope that you are. The title of this message is called Ruined. I feel like God is ruining some people and you don't like it. I have been this person before, just like Peter. But I feel like what's happening in your life right now, whether you know Jesus or you don't know Jesus, is he is ruining you. Now, when I say ruined, I'm not talking about ruined in the natural sense, okay? I'm talking about ruined in a spiritual sense, ruined in the place that this is a good action. This is, creates value. I, you know, in the, in, in the natural world, when you, something gets ruined, it means it loses value. But in the kingdom of God, it means it increases in value because you cease to look like your surroundings. In other words, you're not moved by circumstances anymore. You live by stances, not circumstances, I stand in faith, I stand in hope, I stand in peace. I'm not moved by storms, I'm not moved by struggles, I'm not moved by pain, I have been ruined. I interpret life a lot differently. I interpret elections a lot differently. I interpret ethnicities a lot differently. I interpret money a lot differently. I interpret people, whether they're influencers or they have zero influence. I've been ruined to look at them through the eyes of heaven because I don't want to be caught looking at a shepherd when I should be seeing a king and all I'm seeing is a nobody. I want to be the type of person that when I look at them, I see what heaven sees. I know what he knows. I feel what he feels and I'm convinced by the same things he's moving in their life I want ruined people I don't want normal people average people I don't want the same particular people that come in and out of churches and in and out of Bible colleges. No, I want people who are doing fresh things new things things never been seen impossible things because they have been ruined there's something about being ruined there's something about difference. There's, in a world that tries to celebrate differences but really just wants you to think like them and be like them and act like them and believe like them, it's all about being the same, but they call it different. You ain't different. You're different when you don't look at that stuff anymore, when you don't talk like that anymore, you don't think like that anymore, you don't have those same desires anymore, you've sacrificed so much, you have been ruined. I remember one of my times I got ruined and uh, really one of my defining moments uh, I, I grew up in West Texas, and um, if you've ever been out that way, it's all desert. It's just hot desert. I mean, it's, like, it's, it's a different heat from here. I'm dying to here. I'm telling you. I walked in to the green room back here, and I'm like, I feel like the devil is burping on me the whole time while I'm in Dallas. And I, I remember I, I'm sitting there, and we went to a prayer meeting at Sea at the Pole. Anybody ever been to Sea at the Pole, right? And so I went to a prayer meeting, and, and I'll never forget uh, I, I knew, I went to this one particular high school I was assigned to as a leader, and it, it was a tricky parking situation. You kind of know how to, where to, you kind of had to know where to park because it, well, it was just tricky, and the only reason I know that is I actually got kicked out of this high school. That's a totally different story. Anyways, and so I remember, I'm walking my friend back to her car, and she, she, she stops and goes, where's my car? I said, you park right here? She said, I parked right here. I said, are you sure you parked right here? She said, I parked right here. I said, you can't park here. There's a no parking sign right there. 
You know what she said? She said, they don't mean that. I said, apparently they do, because your car is like no longer here. I don't know, sarcasm might be a fruit of the spirit. Maybe Paul left one off, I don't know. But if you're sarcastic, that's a form of love. And, and I, I, I remember, I said, you better call the number and sign. So sure enough, she calls, they towed her car away. She's like, can you give me a ride? I'm like, dope, I ain't got nothing to do. Let's go, right? So we're driving down the road, it's desert, okay? It's bright, sunny outside, it's desert, it's hot. There's not a cloud in the sky. It's, I'm telling you, it's brown, everything's brown. The ground's brown, the food's brown, the people are brown, everything's brown. Okay, so I remember we get to this dirt lot where they had towed her car and she was gonna go pay for it and we had to walk into this trailer and I'm telling you, we walked in this trailer and even though it was sunny outside, as soon as the door climbed us, it was, as soon as the door closed behind us, it was like, all the sunlight vanished and it was dark. I'm talking about pitch black midnight dark and there was one light on at the end of a hallway and it was flickering. Yeah, it's creepy. I'm telling you, I'm from the hood. I'll stab anything. I'm telling you, right? I'm from where we stab people first and ask questions later. That's where I'm from, all right? Don't, get that, don't let these white pants fool you, okay? And so I, I remember, I remember there's this light flickering, and then all of a sudden, this figure of a man appears, and it yells at us, what do y'all want? And I told my friend, I said, hey, that is talking to you. And she said, I'm, I'm the one parking no parking zone, and this thing talked back. He said, you want parking no parking zone? How come you park no parking zone? No park? Jimmy, run, 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 no parking zone. No I never get a car parking zone. No park. I never get a car parking no park zone. Okay. Now, I don't know what kind of Christians you hang out with, but at this time in my life, I hung out with all the, the crazies, all right? I'm talking about all these people that consider themselves like spiritual terrorists, all right? Because they were always trying to pick a, come on, you can find them in the Glock. Uh, they, they were always trying to pick a fight with the devil. You ever met a Christian like that? I mean, it didn't matter what we were doing. We was fighting the devil. They were trying to find demons in trees, car batteries, popsicles. It did not matter. We was beating up a devil today. Come on, some of you are like, yeah, I'm in that. I'm about that life. And I remember she, I'm sitting there and I'm like, okay, we're not going to die. I'm going to put my back to the wall because I, I know the first prison yard rules is you put your back to the wall. No one's going to get you. Anyways, so I'm sitting there and my friend looks to me and she goes, Chris. I'm like, sup? She's like, we have been sent of the Lord here. And I said, no, 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 no. I said, you have been sent to the Lord here. I knew where to park. She said, stop playing. I said, you stop playing. She said, stop playing. I said, you stop playing. She said, come on, let's pray. So I said, fine. So I did what any Christian does in this situation. I pretended to pray. You ever done that? Yeah, don't you lie to me. Some of you so, ho- I'll watch you in worship tonight. You just seen if she was hot. She's, you're like, she's hot, but so is hell. Anyways, so I, I, I'll never forget. Some, I don't know why you're cheering. You're like, yeah, hell's hot. So hot. Like Dallas. And I remember I pretended to pray, but you know when you're pretending to be spiritual, you oversell it. So I'm sitting there and I'm like, you know, I should have got a tambourine and it would have been all whimsical and the whole thing. And, and I'll never forget, I, I'm pretending to pray and then God speaks to me. And he says, son, I want you to wash that man's feet. Now, what you may not know about me is I'm a germaphobe. No, I'm not. I've been living this life. This whole pandemic, been living this life. I'm a survivor. I'm a day one. Um, people were calling me, what do we do? And I'm like, bet, watch my YouTube channel. I'm like, don't at me, right? I'm, t- I'm not lying. I, won't, I don't eat after anybody. I don't drink. I don't even drink after my wife. I will kiss her in tongues, but I will not drink after her. That's gross. I won't do that. And so I, I remember <laughs> I'm, si- I'm sitting there, and God says, son, wash his feet. So I said, nah, you wash his feet. Then I feel God's presence, that holy pressure come on my heart. Son, wash his feet. And I said, you wash his feet. Son, wash his feet. Come here. First off, we don't even know what that is. All right, secondly, I ain't washing his feet. You wash his feet. He's like, son, wash his feet. I'm like, you created it. You wash his feet. And I'm, I'm going back and forth constantly. Son, wash his feet. No, son, wash his feet. And I said, fine. So I snuck back in the little kitchen they got back there, and they only had cold water. 
I'm thinking as soon as I pour cold water on this man's hoof, he's going to punch me in the throat. <laughs> so, so I, I'm telling you, I got this nasty, crusty coffee mug, Moses himself drank out of this mug. And I'm sitting there, and this guy comes in, and this is a big, hairy, sweaty dude. I mean, he's moving like jello. You know what I'm saying? Like, this guy's coming in, and he's cracking everybody up, pulling up his pants. Can't believe you're parking on Parkinson. Who's going to park on Parkinson? Stop parking on Parkinson. And he sits down and says, sir, listen, I'm sorry, but we're Christians. And, and God tends to speak to us. And, and um, he told me that he wants me to wash your feet. <laughs> That's exactly what I said. This guy said, you want to wash my feet? And I said, yes. <laughs> and then this guy went, okay. And I'm like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. This dude's a freak. That was way too fast. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. So I go over and I, I, I'm like, God be with me. You know? And so I remember I take off his shoe. And y'all... I remember the smell. I know what death smells like. I'm telling you, death lost its sting, but it didn't lose its smell, all right? And so I'm sitting there, and I took off the shoe, and then I peeled his sock off like it was a moist, like it was a banana, like a moist brownie wrapper. I peeled his sock off, and then I came over the cracks of his heels, and he had crevices in his heels. You could shove dead elephant bodies in the cracks behind his heels, and then I came over the top of his feet, and he had the hairiest feet you have ever seen in your life. Looked like a bunch of spiders just having a meeting on the top of his foot. If the wind would have blown, it had done like this right here, just like that, right there. Then I came over on one of his feet, on this man's hoof, he had a big yellow toe. A yellow, how does that happen? A yellow, I'm talking about highlighter, glow in the dark, radioactive, yellow. I remember looking at the feet, and I'm like, I told God, God, this is proof that you hate me. Remember, I sit there, I'm so mad. I grabbed the cold water, poured on the man's hoof. <laughs> Start combing his hair. <laughs> I'm so stupid. Anyways, <laughs> and I'm watching clear water come off this man's hoof, black gray. Like, and, I, and then I start washing, and I can feel the dirt and the buildup and the grime and the little, I can feel it. I know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> And this is, this is how I started my prayer. Let me tell you my prayer of faith. I said, Lord, these feet have seen some rough years. That's how I started it. That's, that's how I started the prayer of faith. Lord, these feet have seen some rough years. But then something shifted on the inside of me. And I said, Lord, but I see these are years that the enemy's stolen away from him. I also see that he's married, but he's separated from his wife, and he has two sons, and their names are this and this. And this is a generational curse because his granddad did this, his daddy's done this, and he's repeating the same cycle. But I say that you're a good God, and by the blood of Jesus, you have broken this curse off of his family. And I say that he's a good husband, and he's a good father, and you will restore this man. I'm praying this big, hairy, sweaty dude starts to cry. <laughs> <laughs> and everything is jiggling <laughs> just like this I'm looking at my friend in the corner and she's like this I mean we catch eyes I mean I look at her she looks at me and I'm like sissy like I'm this great man of God that man gave his life to Jesus that day come on can we thank God for that I celebrate the win in the kingdom no matter who gets it but I remember this was my first time where God was putting me in situations where he's training me to be ruined. I was mad. You ever been mad at God? But you acted like he don't know about it? But he's God? So I decided to come full throttle with it. I was like, no, we're we, we going to talk. We're going to talk. Come on, get in the car. Get in the car. Get in, get in the car. We're going to talk. And I'm getting there, and I'm like, Lord, how am I supposed to be the same knowing you can do that? How am I supposed to live the same knowing that you used me, nothing me, to do that. How, how am I supposed to, what? I said, Lord, how am I supposed to live a normal life? And then I said, I feel like you're ruining me. And you know what he yelled back? He said, exactly. I never called you to be normal. I never asked you to be normal. I never promised you it'd be normal. I'm going to ruin you, and I'm going to ruin you for weakness. I'm going to ruin you for fear. I'm going to ruin you for normal. 
There are people in this room, your normal is to be so numb to your addictions that you have no way of feeling a sense of life and hope again. But there was a Savior who hung naked on a cross so that you could be delivered from that numbness and start feeling the vibrancy of things called life. Sin is choking you to death. And all you're doing is describing the chokehold. But there was a son who came as God in the flesh on the earth and he ruined the devil's plans and he's continued to do that from the beginning of time when he told the stone to get out of his way and he resurrected on his own strength and now we get to be the type of people that we don't need horoscopes and I don't need fortune cookies and I don't need to know what my sign is and I don't need to manifest good energy. What I need is Jesus. There are people in this room who know exactly what I'm talking about because they themselves have been ruined. And if you're going to be ruined, let me give you three things. Three things if you're going to be ruined. Number one, don't go back to normal. You know, I've been, through a lo- I've been to a lot of conferences, a lot of churches. I myself have heard a lot of messages, have delivered a lot of messages. And it's amazing that people could be under the same message, the same anointing, the same atmosphere, answer the same altar call, and one leaves ruined and the other one leaves back to normal. Why would you, have, why would you want to go back to normal? When your normal was hung over, your normal was perverted, your normal was broken, your normal was anxiety attacks that you don't tell anybody about, your normal was destroying you. Why would you want to go back to being normal? God ruined you. There's so much to be said. Don't go back to normal. I, I'm telling you, I, I, you, you have a license to be weird. Let, let's be honest. Some of you, that's why you're single. Some of you, it, you were weird before you got saved. Now you get to be weird after you save. I, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm raising weird kids. I'm raising kids that walk into Target and see crutches and they don't walk to the toy aisle, they walk to the crutches. My daughter was walking out of Target with her Lita, her grandma, we call her Lita, was walking out, and all of a sudden she saw crutches, and she stopped. And she said, Lita, we need to go heal this woman. And, and Lita said, no, your daddy doesn't like when we're late, because I hate late. I don't like late. And, I, and Pastor Adam told me that. And so I remember she said, she said no, Carissa, we can't. That's my daughter. Carissa, we, we can't go. Rissy, we can't. We're going to be late. And she turned, we got to go. And then my daughter said, Lita, we heal people. This is, a, she said, this is why we're going to be late. She walks over, this is a Target in California, and she walks over, lays hands on the woman after getting permission, and the lady totally gets healed and walks out with her crutches. I'm raising weird kids. I'll never forget my daughter Jasmine. <laughs> we were in Wisconsin, and I was preaching at a youth camp, and we had kids everywhere, and, and, and I'm telling you, they're answering just this amazing, they're, they're responding to the love that's in the room, that, that what people would call good vibes or good energy, that's a person. His name is Jesus. And he start, they start responding to the, to the altar call. And, and so my wife's over here. She's prophesying, holding a baby on her hip. Uh, Jasmine's over, I'm sorry, Elisha, my oldest son, is over here. And Jasmine's over here. She's about five. Now, my Jasmine, is, my Jasmine has always been an older soul. She's like five going on 40, okay? Like she's more mature than at least three of me, all right? And so Jasmine's walking, and she's looking for someone to pray for. And she's like, hmm, hmm. And then she sees a girl, and she goes, hmm. She says, come here, come here. So this little girl walks up like this. She says, hmm. She said, five. She said, um, God says that you're to have a smiley life and no more tears. Smiley life, no more tears. When she said it the second time, the power of God hits this girl, and pow, she goes out on the floor, just like that. And Jasmine's like, hmm. So she just keeps walking. Because I remember the first time Jasmine saw that, we were in Sri Lanka, and we were praying uh, uh, for a couple, and I remember she laid hands on this, uh, uh, on the husband, I was laying hands, no, I was, she was laying hands on the wife, I was laying hands on the husband, and her and Elisha were praying for this wife, and all of a sudden I hear this boom on the floor, and this one went out. My kids had never seen that before, and I remember they look at me, and they're like, Dad, somebody did that, like, we didn't do that, like, I was praying for her, and I had to explain to them what was happening, so she sees it again, she's like, hmm, again. You know, she just keeps walking. What my little girl did not know 
is that we got an email a, a couple weeks later that said, you don't know me, but your daughter, and she, she said she was standing on this stage, came up to me and said, I'm supposed to have a smiley life and no more tears. And what she does not know is that I have been diagnosed with clinical depression since the age of nine and I'm 13. She says, I take heavy medication to stay ba balanced, right? And so she goes, she says, but I, I, I'm telling you, something came on me. I fell down, and but I went down, but I got up different. And I ran back to my room. Please tell your parents before you do this. I ran back to my room, took all the pills, and dumped them down the toilet and didn't tell anybody. My mom found the empty pill bottles, got scared, and drove me to the doctor immediately. And the doctor told me, in order for you to have a normal life, you're supposed to take these pills. And she said, that's exactly the problem, is I've been taking those pills, and I had to take more pills, and I had to take other pills. But when I gave my life to Jesus that night, I don't need the pills, I don't need the problems, I don't need it anymore, because God's ruined my normal Come on, where are the ruined ones at tonight? You're not ruined because you're at Christ for the Nations. You're not ruined because you go to church. You're ruined when you live like you're a problem for the devil every day of your life and you become this spiritual jihad. I'm talking about some real jihad. I'm talking about you're casting out devils. You're healing the sick. You're winning souls. You're making disciples. You're raising leaders and you're releasing revivalists. God, give us some ruined people. Don't go back to normal. You know what's interesting? You'll find that Peter had to choose this. Because what we're reading is the decision after he had to say, I'm not going back to normal. Remember, Peter's a fisherman. And if you remember, he gets called while he's fishing. And then he travels with Jesus for three years. Do you remember this? And then Jesus dies. And Peter was not expecting that. So in John 21, verses 1 through 4, the, I'm paraphrasing, the conversation goes like this. Peter's so distraught, not only did Jesus die, but he denied him not just once, twice, but thrice. You remember this? And then he denies him three times. He is discouraged. He is depressed. You talk about mental illness, this is it. He denied Jesus. And then he says this in John 21. He says, I'm going fishing. Let me tell you what, he, th this is not a, I'm hungry, I'm going fishing or I'm bored, I'm going fishing, you know what this is? I'm going back to what I used to be. I'm going back to what I used to know. I'm going back to old patterns, to old habits. Sometimes the temptation is going back to old relationships, going back to old accounts, going back to old mindsets, going back to old attitudes. Why? God has ruined you. You won't make sense to this world. You won't make sense to your, your coworkers. You're not gonna make sense to all your family. But what you do make sense is where it counts because your name will be written in the book of life when you surrender your life to Jesus and you let him completely transform you and you will be ruined. Don't go back to normal. Here's the second thing. If we're gonna be ruined, number two, number two, you didn't get ruined so that you could get ruined. You got ruined so you can go ruin others. It's number two. Dangerous places are safe places in the kingdom of God. If you're going to live ruined, you ought to look for the higher risk possibilities, not the low-hanging fruit. I'm not talking about these easy opportunities. I'm talking about you taking on the assignments that will take years of prayer, of labor, of favor, of faith. I'm not talking about doing what everybody's been done. Come on, you were here with me this morning. I'm talking about taking on assignments where you're shutting down strongholds, where you're tearing down corruption, where you're exposing things of this dark world and you are causing a total shift to happen. Give us some dangerous people again. This world looks at you like you ain't got no teeth. I'm just curious, can the devil take you seriously or not? Oh, they're barking at CF&I, but when they graduate, what will they do? They're going to move into courts of praise and pretend like they're doing something with their life. Oh, I, I did not come. I did not come for people who just want another way, another song. Another, I mean, come on. You're at Christ for the nations. It's a deep well here. The truth is, but God did not bring you here so you can sing spiritual karaoke. And we got all the, I mean, we got all the lights. We got so many lights on me, I feel like a piece of chicken at Popeye's. Look at this thing. <laughs> and we got the smoke with the fake Shekinah. We got it all. 
But the truth is, if you need all of this to encounter him, it's not real. Ruined people know how to carry what's happening in this place, what's happening in your life, and carry it back to your dorm room, carry it back to your job, carry it back to your family, carry it back. Be dangerous. There should be lost people consuming this place. You should take it as a personal challenge at every T&E that there should be people who don't know Jesus would be packing and they have to turn on the lights in these balconies because there's more lost people in this room than there are Bible college students. Be some dangerous people again. My God, can we have a church that actually wins the lost? Dangerous people. I remember one time I had this student, her name was Jasmine. And um, Jasmine called me one morning, it was a Monday morning. She called me. And uh, I was having my quiet time. I remember I answered my phone, and I said, hello? And she goes, Pastor Chris, I need to talk to you right now. I said, well, good morning to you too, Jasmine. She said, stop playing, sir. I need to talk to you right now. I said, well, we on the phone. She's like, no, nah, fam, I need to see you face to face. I need to talk to you right now. So I, I went and asked my wife, so you cool if I pick up Jasmine, running through Starbucks, and then uh, see what she wants to find? She's like, okay. So I, I pick up Jasmine. We're in the uh, drive through Starbucks. Come on, today was uh, official first day of pumpkin uh, spice lattes today. All right. I'm not going to lie, I had my first one today. I got the email. I was totally there. Ask Eric. Eric went with me. And so, anyways, so we're in the drive-thru at Starbucks. Someone got delivered over here. <laughs> There's a freedom that just went out. Anyways, and I remember I, I turned to her. I was sitting in the driver's seat, and I turned to her, and I said, Jasmine, what's so important you got me out here? And she went like this, Pastor Chris, you need to listen. I, I have learned something about the female species, that when your finger does this right here, that's all, boom, that's all. This somehow gives your neck permission to be 30 feet longer than it just was. Because you went from girl to giraffe like that. That's what you did. Pow, this is like some magic button. Pastor Chris, you need to listen. You need to listen, right? I'm telling you, her neck got both sides of her head touched my car. She said, Pastor Chris, you need to listen. I don't even know, what, what is this that's David and Goliath act? What, are you winding up something? Like, what are you doing? She said, Pastor Chris, you need to listen. So I said, okay, tell me. She says, on Friday, I was given an assignment in my speech class. Today, I'm supposed to give a two-minute speech on something important that happened in my life. I said, okay. She said, well, I was praying on Saturday. Holy Spirit spoke to me that I'm supposed to share my testimony in my speech class. I said, you going to do that? You, you really going to do that? Because this is a public high school. I said, you, you, you going to do that? She's like, well, yeah. I'm like, are you going to do that? She's like, yeah. I said, you better do that. You better do that. You better be a sissy and not do that. You better do it. You know, youth pastors, young adult pastors, we get, we, we get excited about the weirdest things, okay? When I got a student going to say, I'm going to take a public stand for Jesus in a public high school, I, I, I hype that up a lot. So I, I said, you better do that. You better not be a sister. No, you better do that. And she said, well, I, I am, but I need you to tell me how to share my testimony. I said, girl, you better pay attention right now. She was chocolate. I almost grabbed her by her braids. I went, you better pay attention right now. She looked at me, and I, I said, listen, what you do is you shed light on the goodness of God. You tell them how good he's been to you. You tell them what he's done in your life. It really bothers me when people share their testimonies and all they share about it is the junk and the garbage and the trash. They're like, you know, I remember I used to get high. I used to party. I used to, I used to, I used to, and, and then I got saved. It was great. The world doesn't want to hear that. They want to hear what you were like in the world. They want to hear what you've been like since you left the world and what Jesus has done in your life. So, so I'm telling her this, we get to school early, we turn up some worship music, I'm praying, we're cast, I'm, I'm telling, we're tearing out every stronghold, we lift every veil, we establish every soul in the kingdom of God. Kids are walking in front of my car and I'm like praying for them just like this, a whole group and I'm like, you know, like I'm all in, I'm impassioned. She finally says, oh, all right, I got to get in there, I got to get in there. I said, okay, you call me as soon as it's done. She's like, bet, right? So she goes in, her speech class is her second period class. She goes in her first period class. And she, she's sitting there, and I don't know if she's praying or having a spiritual whatever, like a seizure, but she's sitting there, and she's like, she's just, everything's shaking, the desk is shaking. She's just praying in the spirit. And then the bell rings, and then that moment comes. Come on, how many you know that moment? The, the moment you about to do what God told you to do, but then all of a sudden you get all kinds of nervous. Y'all know what I'm talking, come on, can we have some real believers in the room for just a second? Y'all know exactly, come on, you feel all the butterflies, forget that, you got, you know, butterflies, you have like pterodactyls going off in your stomach, you know what I'm saying? Sitting in there and, 
and all, you even, the spirit of stupid comes on us sometimes, and we start praying stuff that doesn't even matter. Doesn't even make sense. God, are you ready? You good? You coming? You good? You still want to do it? You still want to do it? I'm just, I, I'm checking on you. I'm checking. I don't want to force you anything. I don't want to force you anything. You good? You good? I mean, you start having these conversations that don't even matter. So by the time she left her first period class, gets to her second period class, she convinced herself, I'm not doing it. I mean, she goes and she sits down in her chair, boom, locked down. She ain't doing nothing. Teacher comes in on a presentation day. What does the teacher ask? Are there any volunteers? Three of you went to school. That's great. She says, are there any volunteers? And, uh, and sure enough, a kid goes, I'll go. He goes up, does a great job, sits down. And then all of a sudden, she goes, are there any more volunteers? Nobody's volunteering. She goes, okay, fine. Um, Jasmine, why don't you come on up here? We need you up here. And Jasmine's like this. And she's, she's walking up. She's like, I mean, I see you, God, but that ain't right. We're going to talk about that later. You play too much. Play way too much. So she gets behind the, the little lectern. Micah Steger would be proud. A uh, little pulpit. And, and, um, and, and, and she says, guys, listen, today I want to tell my, my two-minute speech. Um, the significant moment of my life is the day I gave my life to Jesus. And, like, all the air in this public classroom got sucked out of the room. <gasps> Even the teacher was like... She says, you know, a lot of you know me. You know, I used to get in trouble all the time. You know, I used to party all the time. I used to get high all the time. She even looked at a kid in the front row. She said, remember, we used to get high all the time. <laughs> and this kid's like, oh, I'm, oh, I'm, oh. I don't remember. I was high. That's the way it works. And it's, I mean, she's just like, you know, a lot of you know me. And she says, but, you know, one day one of my coworkers invited me to church. And I came in and I liked it. So I came back the next week. And the people were nice. That's why you should go say hi to three people. And so then she came back the next week. She's like, I could feel God. I don't know what that is, but I know it's God. So she came back the fourth week. I'll never forget the fourth week. We had just got done, finished our pre-service prayer. We always did an hour of prayer before our services. And we opened the doors. She was one of the first ones in. She took one foot inside the sanctuary and pow, went under the power of God. And she started screaming. I mean, now listen, there is a difference between the way caramel, whipped cream, and chocolate cries. I'm going to just tell you right now. Because, because, where my whipped cream? Come on, whipped cream, make some noise. Where my whipped cream at? <laughs> whipped cream tries to have a conversation you while they're full on weeping. <laughs> Snot bubble. <laughs> right? Like, we know what you're saying. Caramel people like myself, we just, you know, we, we have the same face the whole time. This is how we cry. True story. I'm not lying. You know I'm right. But my chocolate family, come on, chocolate, make some noise. Y'all got this on lock right here. She went, Jasmine was chocolate. She went down and she was like, ah, Jesus. Ah, ah, ah. She did that the whole night, the whole night. We had to lead worship over that. We had to do an icebreaker over that. Had to do announcements over that. I had to preach over that. Ah, ah, she's screaming the whole night, moving around the whole service, mass delivery. We were a small little church. We didn't have a closet. You put all the demon folk in until they shut up, and then you bring them out. We didn't have none of that. I'm telling you, people are having to step over Jasmine to get out of the church. She went down, but she got up different. She got up, went home told her brothers what happened. Next week, both of her brothers got saved. We were doing a series on prayer, and they started a prayer meeting for the salvation of their mom and dad, and three months later, both of her parents got saved. Then she started winning all the people at her job and all the people on her campus. She easily doubled the size of our youth ministry because she was winning souls, not in services, not in small groups, not at church gathering. She was in them streets. She was in the malls. She was in the restaurants because she had been ruined. She's sharing all this in a public classroom. So we have always taught our students, you don't just present the gospel, you demonstrate the gospel. Because we say it like this, presentation without demonstration is an abomination. It's half the message, it's half the work. This is why we don't win the masses, because we preach all the time. We've got TV channels, we got YouTube channels, we got podcasts, we got books, we got online curriculums. But where is the power? 
that's, that's good preaching, Pastor Chris. Because I thought we were just trying to make their coffee fresher and their donuts hotter. Some of you are like, that might be my church. I'm here to tell you, if we lack power, we lack it all. And so I remember she, she is sharing her testimony. We've always trained them. You don't just present, you demonstrate. So she, she's a cheerleader on the front row. She's got her arm in a, in, a, in a knee brace. She goes, hey, God's totally healing your knee. Take your knee out of the brace. God's going to totally heal your knee. So she's like, okay. So she takes her knee out of the brace and she starts walking. Oh my God. 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 Becky, Samantha, look at my knee. And God totally heals her knee in front of the whole class. Yeah. And then she turns to a football player in the back of the room. She says, hey, your arm's in a sling. Take your arm out of the sling. God's going to tell you to heal your arm. He's like, okay. So he takes his arm out of the sling and he's like, bruh, 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 this right, this right. Look at my, look at this right. Look at my arm. Look at my arm. God totally heals his arm in front of the whole class. Then she turns to the teacher. Yeah, go, go big or go home. You know what I'm saying? And she says, Miss so-and-so, you've doubted God's real since you're a little girl, but these two miracles are signs to you that Jesus is real. And she throws, Jasmine throws her arm like this. The power of God hits this teacher. She falls out of her chair on the floor and has a two-minute visitation from Jesus right there in the classroom. The teacher's all out, so Jasmine swings back around, and she starts giving prophetic words and words of knowledge. She starts saying, hey, you're pregnant. This is true. You're pregnant. That's the dad. You were going to get an abortion tomorrow, but my church has a ministry that helps crisis pregnancy. God wants you to have this child. They start weeping. People start crying. Who's, she's like, who's addicted to drugs and prescription meds? And this one kid's like, she's like, you're going to get free. Boom, the power of God hits this kid. The teacher gets up. She don't know what happened. The teacher runs out of the room. So Jasmine's like, well, if I'm going to get arrested, I'm going to make this look good. So she starts praying for more. I mean, it went from classroom to church just like that. The teacher ran into the teacher's lounge and grabbed three more teachers. She's like, come here, come here, come here. You have to look, come here, come here, come here, come here. She lines the teachers up and says, hey, uh, Jasmine, do, do it again. Do, do, do it again. I even asked Jasmine, I said, hey, why did why, you throw your arm? She's like, I don't know. I saw you do that, Pastor Chris, and I thought it was a little extra on it. And she, Jasmine goes over and starts laying hands on these people. And sure enough, one by one, boom, 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 all under the power of God. And she is telling them things they've only told their spouses or their parents. Now, I can hear some people's thoughts. How do I know that's real? Prove it. These people exhaust me. <laughs> like nothing, you could watch Dead Rise and you're like, well, I'm not sure you quoted the right scripture. It's just people are, that's the spirit of stupid. That's, that's what that is. And people tell me, how do I know it's real? You want to know why? Because I got the call from the assistant principal. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, Reverend Estrada? Yeah, what's up? He's like, um, sir, do you know Jasmine such a, yeah. Um, sir, we've seen some uh, unique events today. <laughs> do you know what a glory bomb is? Because they asked Jasmine, hey, what went on? She's like, it was a glory bomb. It exploded over the classroom. Why would that happen? Because somebody knows how to be ruined. Because God touched her life. And she started winning souls. Dangerous places. Safe places. I'm here to tell you, you are without excuse tonight. I love those people. This might be your first time in a church setting, and you're wondering, like, where's all this energy? Like, where's all this high? Like, what? oh, my God. What would you invite me to? I want to tell you I love you enough, and I respect you enough to tell you that there is a Savior that you are in desperate need of. And while you choke on your different polarities, passions, or problems, Jesus has already offered the opportunity for you to be set free completely. I can tell you that as someone who came from a broken home, someone who came completely confused, someone who grew up, I, I should be dead, I should be a drunkard, I should be a drug dealer. I, 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 I should be abusive to my wife, I should be absent to my kid. This is a family lineage, this is my life, I should be that. On that piece of carpet over there, that piece, that piece of land over there, God touched my life 
right here in this very room 21 years ago. And I have not been the same since. And more, the majority of my life has spent more walking with God than without. And I can tell you that I would take any day of sacrifice, if it cost me to surrender everything that I thought I needed right now, I would do it all over again. You're looking at someone who's been sober 21 years. You're looking at somebody who's been completely set free from perversion 21 years. You're looking at somebody who's had people in their life helping them through their journeys and their struggles 21 years. I'm living proof. Don't, don't let these, this mic mistake you. I'm telling you, don't miss your moment tonight. There's an invitation. There's an invitation. Because the Bible says this, number three, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Meaning the, the people you read about how Jesus treated them in the Bible, he treats you the same way. You hear me talking about the way he did for me or what Jasmine or my daughter or anyone else, he'll do the same for you. He won't just do the same for you today, he'll be there for you tomorrow. Can I tell you something? Therapy is important, but therapy can't do that for you. You still have to schedule that out. But Jesus, always available. You could, you, you could put your trust in all these potions and cards. And I'm from California. People are into some unique stuff. You put all your trust in that. But why are you still in fear? Why are you still afraid? Why do you still live like something from... The ground under your feet is going to fall. I'm telling you, you're broken. You're broken. I love you enough to tell you you're broken. And it's not until you surrender your life to Jesus that everything becomes better. I'm not saying easier. I'm saying better. The Bible says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. There might be some people in this room. We've got to be careful with that. Because let me put it in our world. Jesus Christ... It, when he talks about yesterday, some of us could get caught up in the good old days. You, you've been in church your whole life, and you had God moving in your church, or whatever stream you came from, or whatever denomination. You, you were so used to God moving that way. The worship was that way. The preaching was that way. The services was that way. But you're stuck in the good old days. And, and then there was another side of Jesus that was God the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's called the someday. Well, someday, Pastor Chris, someday... I'll be like Jasmine in a classroom. Someday I'll be like your daughter. Someday I'll be like Pastor Adam. Someday. There's a space between the good old days and someday. And they said Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Hebrew language didn't have the word that we have in English called now. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, right now, and forever. I'll never forget when I had a conversation with the late Reinhard Bonnke. He looked at me and he said, with that heavy German accent, he said, Chris, whoever you preach Jesus to be, that's who he'll be. If you preach him to be a savior, he'll save souls. If you teach him to be a deliverer, he'll free people. If you preach him to be a healer, he'll show up and heal people. Whoever you preach him to be, that's who he'll be in the moment. I'm here to tell you and preach to you that he is everything you need tonight. He is the same yesterday, today and forever. Would you stand up with me?